one of the coolest arm sleeves of a pastor. That's a very small crowd to be cool with. So I appreciate that, but there's not a lot of competition. By the way, do you notice he's wearing a Yankees hat? How cool is that? I mean, a man of God in the house today. I love it. Hey, we're so glad that you're here. Uh, I don't know if you're like me. I'm from Arizona. I've lived the majority of my life here, and I have been stoked that the weather has finally gotten below 100, and I was like, we did it. Another year. We survived. We did it. Anyone check the forecast this week? I was like, Jesus, please. I mean, we, we need this. Like, why? Why? You know, and so we got another week of 100 plus, so... Not out of it yet, and if, uh, if this is your first summer here, I always feel so bad for people who are like, I just moved here, and I heard good things, and I'm like, it'll get better, it'll get better, just hang in there. Uh, we're so glad that you're here, and, uh, and I'm excited to dive into the scriptures with you today. I want to talk about something that, um, depending on how you're wired and your personality, you, you may not initially agree with, um, but our brains are wired in certain ways. And, and we don't really like this because we like to f- feel like I'm independent. You know, I, my brain goes where I tell my brain to go. Uh, sure, but your, your brain is wired in a certain way, and, and you normally respond in certain ways to certain things. And there are people that know this, and they, they play to that. And there are other people that seem woefully oblivious to the fact that our brains work in certain ways. And, and every now and then I'll see things that I'm like, did no one think this through? Did no one, like, talk about this? Did you not realize how this would play out? Like, let me give you a few different images that will, will kind of illustrate this. Like, imagine you were going to the movie theater, right? And you look up, and you're like, all right, what movies are, are available? And, and you see this. You know, I have a couple options. There will be blood or definitely maybe. Or if you read this the way most of our brains will, there will definitely be blood maybe, which I'd argue is a much more intriguing title. Like, I want to know how that story is going to play out. But, again, it depends on how you read that. Or how about this mug? You could read it like, never give up. Come back, Robert, which is very encouraging. Or the way most of us read it, never come back. Give up, Robert. Very different message, right, depending on how you choose to read it. Or this one's my favorite. What is that trying to say? Some of you are like, I see a word on there that I don't think is supposed to be there, right? Uh, That's supposed to just communicate free water. That's all that's trying to say. Uh, But if you're like the rest of us, you see an extra word in there um, that's not an appealing word uh, when it comes to wanting to order water, right? And and I wonder, I mean, like, they probably thought this is going to be super creative. Like, people are going to see this art. They're going to take photos with it. And then I imagine they installed it, and they took a step back, and they went, Oh, no, what have we done? You know, like this is, this is totally different because they didn't understand there's a certain way your brain is going to read that, and it's probably not the way they intended. Now, on the flip side, you see people who lean into this, who go, oh, we're going to play to that and make it a strength. Like uh, this is an old ad, but this is so brilliant in its simplicity and in the way it works. That reads the same both ways. So you can see Steve Martin and Martin Short Either way you read that, which I just think how clever because they know that's the way your brain is designed. Now, I know there's still some of you, probably men, uh, who I still haven't convinced yet. And you're like, nope, doesn't apply to me. I read things the way I want to read things. Okay, fair enough. I, I present one final illustration. Read this. I rest my case. Uh, the fact that you probably read that in the, just show of hands, how many of you read that in the order they said you would read it, right? Look around the room. Uh, so I think I've illustrated that your brain is wired in a certain way, and there are people that know it, and they know exactly the way your brain is wired. And I would suggest good marketing, good communication, whatever we're trying to do, uh, plays to the way that it's supposed to go. Like there is a way that things work. And, and you, when you see it, you're impressed. You're like, wow, that's dialed in. And when you see it not used, you're like, wow, that doesn't make any sense. Now, here's what I want to do. I want you to apply this thinking to Christianity. How would you describe the way you navigate Christianity? 
Is it like this slide where you go, yeah, I'm, I'm really dialed in. I know what Christianity is about. I, I've, I've got a really good grasp of it. Or would it be like one of the other slides where you're like, well, I kind of have extra words in there that are not supposed to be there. And you have to take a step back and it doesn't always make sense. Like when we talk about Christianity, we don't always know how does it work, uh, what's it supposed to be, how do we read it the right way. And I can illustrate this with a question. And we would have lots of different answers to this question. But what launched the growth of the church? So today you and I are a part of something that has literally been going on for generations and generations and generations. And it keeps getting told and retold and more people invited. And that's why we're all here today. This thing started thousands of years ago. So what started this thing that you and I are a part of today that we decided today we're going we're gonna to tap into this? What on earth launched this thing? How did it begin? How did it become something that all of these years later you and I would want to be a part of? Now, we would have different answers to this. If I were to go around, just pass the mic around, what do you think started the growth of the church? We'd have different answers. Some of you might say, well, it's our beliefs, right? It's, it's the beliefs of Christianity. Uh, they're, they're just more true than anything else, or they're more real, or, you know, they're, they're better, they're stronger. You might want to say it's, it's the things that we believe that is what has launched the growth of the church. Others might say, no, it's not the beliefs, it's the practices. It's how we, we get together. It's things like communion, you know, the, the ways in which we practice our faith. That's what it is. Others might say, no, 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 it's like those Puritan disciplines. You know, we're just better. You know, we're, we're, we're tougher. We can do things. We're better people than, than others. You know, we might have all sorts of answers to this question. Here would be my answer. I would say what launched the growth of the church was a story. It was a story. It was a story about what they had seen this guy do. And it forever changed the people who were involved, and they told other people. And those people told other people, and those people told other people, and those people told other people, on and on and on. And you and I are a part of an ongoing story that continues to invite people in. And so we're going to look at today, uh, what does it mean to follow Jesus through the lens of a story? Understanding this faith that we said, hey, let's strip all the things down, let's talk about this as, as the most compelling story ever told. What if we framed it like that? There's a, a, an old Jewish expression that says, God created man because he loves stories. I think that's a beautiful idea. I mean, if you've ever read the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament, to, to Jews it would be the Hebrew Bible. What is it filled with? Story after story after story, right? There's some weird laws in there as well, but lots of stories. And you have all these stories. And I don't know if you've ever read the Old Testament. There's some crazy stuff in there. I mean, like not age appropriate to even read some of the verses in, in uh, a setting like this, right? I mean, crazy stories in there. And it's story after story. You can just imagine communities sitting around a campfire telling these stories generation after generation. You get to the New Testament, and, and we see Jesus, and how did Jesus teach? And we might think Jesus, all right, everybody, get your scrolls out. I'm going to give you 20 things to write down today and, and you know, five application points. This is going to be awesome. No, Jesus is like, let me tell you about a farmer. And I was like, oh, all right, what's about a farmer? Let me tell you about this guy that was walking down a road, and he got jumped. Oh, wow, tell me about that. Let me tell you about these workers in a vineyard. Oh, yeah, tell me about that. Jesus had stories, and he would just make these stories up to teach these, these bigger truths. People were drawn into that, like, wow. And I love this about Christianity. I love that Christianity is so heavy on stories because I am a storyteller. That is how I'm wired. I love a good storyteller. And in, in fact, I, I kid you not, when I was in kindergarten, I got an award that I am still proud of to this day. I got the best storyteller award in kindergarten. Thank you, right? I'm very proud of that. To this day, I'm like, I had talent early on. They saw it. They recognized that this kid has got something. Probably I just wouldn't stop talking about things that I got excited about was my guess. But they looked at me and they said, hey, this kid can tell a story. And I, I love telling stories. And then I met someone. And I married her, and she has a very different view of stories than I do. See, to me, a great story is I'm going to bring you along one detail at a time, just slowly, 
build the tension. You're going to be leaning forward like, yes, keep going. What happens next? And my wife's like, tell me the end now or I'm not listening to the rest of this, you know. And so I've learned there are two types of people with stories. Now, she likes stories. She just likes to know the end of the story right away. Like, don't make me wait to know where this story is going. And I've learned that there are people that when they want to read a fictional novel will go to the back of the book. This hurts me to even talk about out loud. We'll go to the back of the book to see what happens, and then we'll read the story. And I'm like, what is wrong in your head that you think that's the way to enjoy a story? But I just have learned there are different people, and we all, you know, appreciate stories in different ways. But I'm very proud. I have genetically passed down some of my story genes to my children. The other day, I, I came home, and my daughter was telling me the story, and, and she was going detail by detail. And I'm literally leaning across the table. I'm like, yes, what happened next? And my wife walks by, and she goes, oh, my gosh, get to the end. And I'm like, what? And then I realized she's got it. She's got the same gene. You know, it's like I passed it on, and it's a beautiful thing. But we all engage with stories in different ways. And so uh, today we're going to continue the series that you've been in called Sunday School. And we're going to look at how do we understand Christianity from the lens of being a storyteller, uh, of engaging with the story and sharing the story with others. If you've got your Bibles, we're going to be in Acts chapter 2, which is the fifth book into the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Acts. Uh, so go over there if you have a physical Bible with you. If you've got a Bible app on a device, I encourage you to get that out and, and, and read along as well. Uh, I'd love for you to read the text as we get into this story together. What we're going to see today in today's passage is Peter the storyteller. Okay, Peter is going to tell a story, and it's a very compelling story. And what we're going to learn from Peter are three little prompts uh, if you're going, hey, I don't really know how to do this, uh, I'm going to give you three ways to see what Peter is doing that you can then take away and go, okay, I could try that. I, I could learn from Peter, uh, and I could try that today. And it's a totally different way of sharing your faith, of experiencing this message together. Now, before we get into Acts 2, let me give you the setup, okay? It's about 50 days after Jesus has been crucified, okay? So that is not like a distant memory to them. That's like happened a couple months ago. Like they, they are still, you know, processing what they saw happen to Jesus. He rose again. They're all like processing this like, all right, so this guy we followed was killed, but then he's, he's not dead anymore. And like, what does this mean for us? And so you have these early followers of, G, of Jesus figuring this out together. Now they're in Jerusalem. And it happens to be a big Jewish festival called Pentecost. Now, Pentecost, Jews from all the nations around would come into Jerusalem to celebrate Pentecost together. So imagine you have this, like, like this huge gathering of people from all different nations with all different languages. And then you have these, these Jesus followers who live in Jerusalem. They're all there, too. And they're all kind of mixed in, and many of them were, were Jews as well. Then, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes down upon all the Jesus followers in, in a way that had never happened before. They're all filled with the Spirit, and they do something miraculous. They start speaking in other languages. Like, literally, they start talking in languages they don't know. And in particular, they're speaking the languages of all of the Jews that had been gathered there. So these Jews who have come in for Pentecost, they have not come in for anything related to Jesus. They've come in for Pentecost. They see this group of Jesus followers who start speaking their language. And all these Jews look over and go, what's going on with that? How, how come I can understand them? How, how do these guys know my language? And then the next person going, they're speaking my language. and they're, they're speaking my language. And they're all trying to figure out what on earth is going on. How are these Christians you know, speaking in, in my language. They cannot figure it out. And Peter's like, all right, I got this. Peter gets up and is like, story time. Let, let me illustrate to you what's going on. So this is Acts chapter 2. We begin reading in verse 14. Then Peter stepped forward with the 11 other apostles and shouted to the crowd. I love this. Listen carefully, all of you, fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem. Make no mistake about this. These people are not drunk, as some of you are assuming. Nine o'clock in the morning is much too early for that. No, what you see was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. And your old men will dream dreams. 
In those days I will pour out my spirit, even on my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy. And I will cause wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and clouds of smoke. The sun will become dark and the moon will turn blood red before that great and glorious day of the Lord arrives. But everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, before I get into what, what story prompt we're looking at here, I got to just acknowledge this is one of my favorite, funniest parts of all of the Bible. And it's easy to miss. And you, you may have gone, wait, what? Um, notice what the accusation is. They, these, these Jews from all the nations hear their languages being spoken, and they're going, okay, we can't explain this. How would they all be able to do that? And so then they suspect, oh, these men must be drunk. That's why. They're all drunk. That's why it sounds like we're hearing our own languages. They've ever done that they're slurring in, in many different languages, right? And so that's what they assume. So Peter gets up and goes, whoa, 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 whoa. They are not drunk, as some of you su suppose. And then notice why he says they're not drunk. Did you catch it? It's only 9 a.m. in the morning. Peter's like, it's way too early for that, <laughs> which is like the best Christian argument against getting drunk. Like, you think we're drunk? Nah, not yet. <laughs> yeah, not yet. No, nah, not, 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 not time for that, you know. Peter's like, it's 9 a.m. What, what, what kind of savages do you think we are? Like, no. You know, and, and what, we, what would we expect Peter to go, drunk? No, no. We, we, we don't, dr you know, drink, smoke, or chew, or go with women who do. Like, you know, we have all these lines. Like, no, we don't do that kind of stuff. Peter's like, nah, it's too early. They're not drunk. That's not the reason why, which I just find so fascinating. So he's like, no, let me tell you why. And he begins to explain. Now, I would say if we were to describe what is Peter doing here, here's the first prompt. Peter's explaining, how is your life different because of Jesus? Look, the reason why these men are speaking in languages they don't know is because of this guy named Jesus. And right now the Holy Spirit has come upon them, and this was like foretold to happen, and Peter's explaining why what they're seeing is happening in the first place. And this is an amazing takeaway for you and I. Well, I don't, I don't know how to tell a story. I don't know how to engage in Christianity in a story. How is your life different because of Jesus? How are you a, a person that you would not have been otherwise? Like, I can tell someone, like, if we're talking about things that I believe or, or things that I do, sometimes they'll go, like, what? Like, that's a weird one. Why do you do that? And I'm like, oh, that's because I follow Jesus. And, like, and I'll explain. He, because of Jesus, I arrived at this position on this issue, you know. And, and a lot of times, like, oh, so they're seeing something, and then they're questioning it. Like, has everyone ever seen something you've done, like a decision you've made or a belief you have? And they go, why, why are you saying that? Why are you doing that? That's a great chance to go, oh, let me explain to you why I'm different because of Jesus. Now, you can also think about this in reverse. Who would you be? If you didn't follow Jesus. Now, some of you are like, I, I don't follow Jesus. Well, you're who you are right now. There you go. But you don't know what kind of person you would become if you did follow Jesus. So for those of us who are following Jesus, that's what you're saying. Like, okay, how would I be different? Would I be more of this or less of that? Or, or in what ways would I be different if I didn't follow Jesus? And if you can't think of an answer to this, uh, your faith hasn't really made a dent in your life. Okay, so hopefully you can go, no, there's things I'd be, I would do differently if I didn't follow Jesus. And so this is a great prompt. And it's usually, this one's probably the easiest because it's usually prompted by someone else. It's a question. What on earth is going on? Just like they see these, these uh, early Christians going, how are they doing that? Someone may look at you and go, why, why are you doing that? How are you doing that? What's going on? How did you react that way? How, did, you know, how are you believing the way you're believing? How, how do you have the attitude that you have? Whatever that is, that's a chance for you to say, hey, let me tell you how my life is different because of Jesus. Keep reading. Get to verse 22. People of Israel, Peter continues, listen. God publicly endorsed Jesus the Nazarene by doing powerful miracles, wonders, and signs through him, as you well know. But God knew what would happen, and his prearranged plan was carried out when Jesus was betrayed. With the help of lawless Gentiles, you nailed him to a cross and killed him. But God released him from the horrors of death and raised him back to life, for death could not keep him in its grip. 
So now Peter's changing gears. He's explained what these guys are doing, how they're speaking, you know, in different languages. Then he switches gears to our second prompt, who is Jesus? And Peter's like, all right, let me tell you about Jesus now. So, like, you're, you're wondering why these guys are doing what they're doing. I just answered that. Now let me tell you who is Jesus. Now, let's be honest. I've been doing this long enough. This is the point where I lose some of you because some of you are going, Okay, yeah, I could probably tell someone how I'm different because of Jesus, especially if they ask me. I could do that. Uh, then you get to this, like, who is Jesus? You're like, nah, I don't know how to answer that. I don't know how to, to say that well. I would do it the wrong way, or I'm not sure how they would respond. And at this point, we start going, ah, maybe I'm not a storyteller. Maybe this isn't for me. I, I know what it feels like, okay, to, 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 to feel that, that sense of, like, nervousness of, like, I don't know how I would say this. Now, you may look at me and go, yeah, I'm sure you do. Uh, you're standing on stage with a microphone talking about Jesus. Like, you probably don't know what it feels like. And here's what I would tell you. In this context, I am very comfortable, okay, much more comfortable than a typical person. You could put me in front of thousands of people. I would be fine. But I realized the other day, this is not, this is not like I never get nervous about anything, uh, even when it comes to speaking. A couple weeks ago, I flew to Oregon. Uh, we've been working on uh, finalizing the licensing for our second rental home there. And the, one of the last things we had to do is get approval from the city planning council or something like that. And so I had to fly in and go to this, like, town council planning meeting, which sounded riveting, and make a case for why we should be approved to have this short-term rental license. So I fly in, and, and I, I don't know about you, I don't spend a lot of time in town council meetings, so I'm not really sure what to expect. How long is this going to be? How many people are going to be there? I don't really know even the format. I get there. It's me and one other person in attendance. And then imagine a, like a half circle, uh, tables lined up uh, with about eight people. They're each sitting behind a name tag and a microphone, and they're all in a semicircle. And then there's one table in the middle with a microphone uh, when you get to go speak. So we sit down, and I, and I immediately go, whoa, this is really intense. Like all of a sudden I can feel like my, in my body like I, I'm nervous. Like I, I am feeling this and I'm just like I would much rather have a crowd of people and a microphone than these eight people, you know, grilling me in front of this little table. So I'm sitting there and they start to explain how the evening's going to go and on the agenda. And again, I'm kind of like reading my agenda and I'm the first uh, item of discussion on the agenda. I'm like, all right, let's go. And so they start kind of reading it. And <laughs> then the chair says, and there have been two uh, people file opposition against this. And so one has written in uh, their, their testimony and the other one will, will show up via Zoom to make their argument. What? I'm like, okay, I, I'm debating people? Like, what, what, what are we doing here? Like, I don't know any of this uh, before I walk in. So I'm like, okay. So they get to the part where they're going to read the letter, and I'm thinking, well, this will be interesting to find out what's in the letter. And so all the council gets out the letter, and for about five minutes, they all silently read it while I wait and just wonder what's in the letter. Like, I don't know what this neighbor said as to why they don't want us to have a short-term rental. I, I have no idea. So I'm just sitting there, and I'm starting to get more and more nervous. And then after that, the guy says, okay, so here's how we'll do uh, verbal uh, testimony. Um, you know, Jeremy, you'll have 15 minutes to make your case, to give a story as to why you want us to approve this. Uh, the other person who has, you know, complained against it will have 10 minutes for a rebuttal. Then you'll have five minutes to respond to that. I'm literally thinking, like, what have I gotten myself into? I don't even know what we're arguing about. You know what I mean? Like, I, okay. And I literally, in that moment, I mean, my palms are sweaty. Like, my, my tongue is getting dry. And then it's like, all right, please come up to the microphone and, you know, present your thing. And I, I walk up and I sit down. Mind you, I do this for a living. I turn my mic on, like, hi, I'm Jeremy. You know, I'm like, I've never done this before. Like, what is going on with me? And I just realized, like, wow. I'm not used to this feeling, but here's what I know is that most people feel very uncomfortable about this point in, in this journey of like, I, I don't think. And I think we've made this out to be something huge of like, if you're going to tell someone about Jesus, you have to know the right way to do it. And there's this, the, the Romans road. And, this, and we have all these techniques to do it. And I think we've way overcomplicated something very simple. Th that something very simple is just tell someone what you know about Jesus. Like, who is Jesus? How would you answer that? You would probably answer it in a story. 
well, Jesus was a guy who da 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 and you would start explaining what Jesus did and what they did to Jesus and what happened afterward, right? And that's what Peter's doing here. Notice this is not like a ton of theology. This is just Peter telling a story. Hey, let me tell you about Jesus the Nazarene, what you did to him and what happened afterward and what God did and God raised him. You know, he's, he's just telling the story. It's something all of us can do. Now, maybe you're thinking, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, still easier said than done, because what if I say, hey, I want to tell you about Jesus, and they say, I don't believe in Jesus. Like, then I'm stuck. I'm going to give you a great response, okay? Because it's not uncommon for you to get that response, right? And it, that's just reality. So if you say, hey, I, you get in a con- conversation, like, hey, can I tell you about Jesus? And someone goes, oh, I don't believe in Jesus. Let me give you the best response I've learned in, in my time doing this. You, you simply respond with this. Oh, Which Jesus don't you believe in? You ask them a question. Which Jesus don't you believe in? Now, right now, some of you are going, how many Jesuses are there, right? Like, there's only one, but the reality is, is that we have presented collectively, we have presented Jesus very differently. Some Christians have presented him this way, some Christians this way, some Christians this way. And and so when it comes to, when people think about Jesus, really what they're thinking about is the way Jesus has been presented to them by the Christians they have met. And even more specific than that, what they're probably going to figure out is how have they seen Christians around them behave and were they interested in that? And if the answer is no, if they're like, those people are awful, they are not interested in the Jesus that these Christians claim to follow. So when I ask that question back, I'll say, oh, tell me which, you know, which Jesus do you not believe in? They'll be like, well, what are you talking about? I'm like, oh, well, like, how, do you, how do you think Jesus is? And they'll usually say some things about Jesus that I don't agree with either. And I'll say, oh, yeah, I don't believe in that Jesus either. And all of a sudden, it's, it's like a very disarming conversation, like, you don't believe that's how Jesus is? Like, no, not at all. And then I said, can I tell you how I believe Jesus? Like, how I've seen him? And it opens the door for a totally different conversation. And, and friends, literally, one of the passions of my life is to show people that Jesus is better than they think he is. Because most people, I, I have found, have a limited, partially good view of Jesus. And almost every conversation I'm in with someone, I'm trying to argue them, Jesus is better than they think he is. He's bigger, he's, he's more loving, he's more gracious. He's, I mean, just, he blow your mind. Like, those are the conversations I'm in. But all you have to do is, is open the door. Just say, hey, can I, can I tell you? And the worst they're going to say is, I don't, I don't, I'm not interested in that Jesus. Great, which Jesus are you not interested in? Because I'm, I'm probably not interested in that Jesus either. So Peter tells the story about Jesus. Then we get to the third one, verse 25. He, he kick, kicks it in a different gear. King David said this about him, I see that the Lord is always with me. I will not be shaken, for he is right beside me. No wonder my heart is glad and my tongue shouts his praises. My body rests in hope, for you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. You have shown me the way of life, and you will fill me with the joy of your presence. Ooh, that sounds good. So now, what is, what is Peter talking about? Why are you following Jesus, what would cause you to do this? What, what, help me understand why are you following Jesus? And to do that, Peter's like, hey, let me tell you about King David and why King David followed Jesus. Now, if you're uh, uh, learned in the Bible, if you've read this story before, you may notice, hold on, there's an issue here. Time out, time out, time out. Um, this argument doesn't make sense. Because if you know the timeline, King David came before Jesus, right? So King David is, you know, one of the the most famous kings in the Old Testament. That all was before Jesus did his ministry and died and all that. So so Peter, uh, I'm a little confused in your argument here. How are you saying that King David was following Jesus? And I'm going to let you in on a little secret, okay? Uh, I have a seminary degree, and this is a little fun fact that that you learn in seminary. Uh, The New Testament writers hijack the Old Testament. Like, straight up hijack it. What I mean by that is they will take almost anything from the Old Testament and point it to Jesus. And you see this all throughout the New Testament. Peter's doing it here. Peter's taking something that was King David talking about the person of Jesus. 
No, he had never seen the person of Jesus. He didn't know who Jesus was the way you and I know Jesus. But Peter, as he retells it, is reframing this of obviously Peter's talking, or uh, David is talking about Jesus. Now, you may go, well, that's just kind of like a weird thing. It happens all over the New Testament. They are constantly taking the things from the Old Testament and pointing them to Jesus. Why are they doing that? They're showing you reasons why they're following Jesus. Because in the New Testament writers' minds, Jesus is the fulfillment of all of it. Everything they have been looking for, waiting for, hoping for, they see it point to Jesus. So they're going to connect all of those dots always back to Jesus. And when you see this, you start to go, oh, I get what you're doing. You're Okay, you're doing it again. And it is all over the New Testament. Okay, so I just showed you an example of Peter doing it. But the guy that wrote the majority of the New Testament is a guy named Paul. Paul does this left and right all over the New Testament. In fact, I'm going to read to you a quote from a theologian who is commenting on how heavily Paul does it and the way in which Paul does it throughout the New Testament. Okay, this is the theologian named P. Enns. He says, explaining how the Jesus story made Israel's story and every person's story is more or less what Paul's letters are about. Now, that's an amazing sentence, but maybe a little confusing. He's saying, uh, explaining how Jesus made the Old Testament story, which is about one group of people, a story for all of us today is what Paul is constantly doing. Not every word or verse, but the heart of them. And to pull that off, Namely, to convince his fellow Jewish Christians, Paul had to present Israel's story as a universal story. Paul transforms a tribal story of kings, land, and the purity of one group of people into a global story of God's grace and peace to all nations. As famously confusing as Paul's letters are, if we keep this in mind, a lot of what Paul, sa- Paul says will make more sense. Here's the, here's the idea. Unless you are culturally and ethnically Jewish, you would technically say the Old Testament stuff doesn't apply to you. Like it was written to Jews. And we're not in that covenant. We're not in those descendants. Unless you're Jewish by birth, you, you would not feel a connection. Except if you read the New Testament, they include all of us now into all the things that happened in the Old Testament. There's all this imagery of grafting us into this tree and all these, these ways that the New Testament writers do. And what they're doing is they're saying, look, this whole story has been leading us to this moment, and it's why we follow Jesus. And, and, and when you read the New Testament like this, I promise you, you'll read it differently. And you'll start seeing it all over the place of like, oh, I don't think that originally was saying that. But as this writer is looking back, he's pointing it to Jesus. It all goes back to Jesus. So just looking at this, this passage in Acts 2, we see three different ways that Peter is engaging stories to, to share the gospel in this transformative moment in the early life and growth of the church. And what I want you to realize is this is not like a, hey, every conversation you get in, you have to hit all three of these. That completely misses the point. These are tools in your toolbox. When you go, hey, I want to have conversations with people, I want to have meaningful conversations, I want to be able to to share what matters most to me, those are three easy prompts to keep in mind to go, hey, these are three ways I can get into this conversation and share a story. Not a bunch of theology, not a bunch of you should do this and you should stop. No, to share a story in a way that people go, oh, I can connect with that. So as we begin to wrap this up, here's a question for us to consider. What is our responsibility as Christians? So once you sign up, you sign on the dotted line, you get dunked, I'm in. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a Christian. What now is my responsibility? Now, I've been in ministry long enough to know there is such a diversity of answer to this question. So if you go down, uh, we'll say, Mill Avenue, and you see the, the street preacher yelling into the megaphone, why are they doing that? They're doing that because in their mind, that is their responsibility as a Christian. Now, you may look at that and go, well, that, that's silly. I, I don't think they have to do that. And there would be people on all ends of the spectrum. I go, no, their responsibility is this or, or that. What is our responsibility? And truthfully, I have met very stressed out Christians who literally, I think, believe it is their job to convert everyone around them. 
And so they feel like there's a pressure. You've got to convert your family members. You've got to convert your coworkers. You've got to convert your friends. And if you don't convert them, you're not really a good Christian. You have abdicated your responsibility. And, and friends, if that's where you believe, that's between you and God. But here's what I'm going to tell you. That's not, that's not what I think the responsibility of Christians is. What do I think it is? I think it's to tell the best stories. I don't think it's more complicated than that. To tell the best stories. You say, hey, I, can, I, I know that you believe this and that. That's, that's awesome. But can I tell you, like, why I believe this? And give them a chance to see what you believe. To hear a story that they may go, whoa, that's, that's cool. I've never heard it like that. I've never seen it like that. I've never thought of it the way you're describing it. I'll close with this illustration. There's a book called Bullies and Saints uh, by a guy named John Dixon. And John is a historian of church history in particular. And this is an incredible book if this subject interests you. He goes through what are some of the best examples of the church throughout history and what are some of the worst examples. And the reality is he says there are moments that you can look at, at the church collectively and you could say the church is the bully. The church is abusing people. And guess what, friends? You read church history, there's lots of that. And we have to come to terms with how, how is that part of our history. But there's also moments where you go, the church was beautiful. The church was incredible. The church literally changed that culture, changed that community, changed that story. And it's both. And in this book, he talks about how can it be both. And he gives an, an, an illustration that I think is so powerful. And it's one that I think of often. Here's what he says. Christ wrote a beautiful tune which the church has often performed well and often badly. But the melody was never completely drowned out. Sometimes it became a symphony. I love the, the illustration of what if we thought of the gospel as a melody, as the most beautiful melody line you had ever heard. And in a noisy world, sometimes you begin to hear that melody. You go, what is that? What is that tune? What is that song? It's so beautiful. And when you and I live in conjunction with this, when, when we live in partnership with Jesus, you and I begin to play the melody in our lives. And when you play the melody and you play the melody and you play the melody and together we're playing the same melody, it becomes a symphony. It's the most beautiful picture of what the church can be. Not us coercing people and shouting at people and legislating people to believe what we believe, but performing the most beautiful melody the world has ever heard. And they go, what is that? What is that sound? In a noisy world filled with so much noise and dissonance and, and things that are harsh on the ears, can you imagine someone who hears that melody for the first time and goes, wow, that's beautiful. What is that? And there are moments throughout history the melody has been hard to hear. You can look at times in church history and go, I can barely even see the melody there. But the melody continues. And the invitation for you and I is to use our lives to share that melody. And the easiest way to do it is just to tell stories. Hey, let me tell you what I've seen. Let me tell you about this Jesus that I've experienced and how Jesus has changed me. And the invitation for you and I, when we do it together, we become the symphony for a world to hear it. Let's pray together. Jesus, thank you for the melody. Thank you for this tune that is unlike anything else we've ever heard. It, it is just so beautiful in the midst of all the sounds that we hear all the noise that we hear. And it's not a coercive melody. You won't make us play it. You won't make us listen to it. You invite us. And if we choose to play the melody and we choose to do it together, something profound happens. We begin to, to, to play it in a way that the world can hear it. And so, God, that's our, our prayer today. That's our desire today is that you would use our lives to share this melody. That together as a community, we would look like a symphony. That we would play something for the, the world to, to stop and listen to and to be intrigued about like they were in Acts 2. What is going on? How are you guys living like that? What, what, what has caused this community to be like that? So Jesus says, we think about what it means to follow you and all the, the ways that we complicate this. 
Can we just simplify it to the most beautiful story that the world's ever heard? And we have a chance to partner with you in telling that to others. May you use us for your symphony, we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. I know personally, a lot of times in my life, it's, it's so hard to hear that melody. Um, I know growing up, uh, I used to play the violin uh, in a big, massive orchestra, and it was so easy sometimes for me to kind of check out, get on my phone and, and not partake in, in what was going on and, and say, no, I'll, I'll catch up and I'll learn that kind of stuff later. And as I, as I began to began to grow in, in that practice, I started to see the more that I would play along with that orchestra, with that symphony, the more joy that I would have in, in that craft and the more fulfillment that I would experience in that setting of a large group of people all for the same goal and for the same mission. And so not of all, all of us play the, the violin or, or the cello or, or the trumpet, but in that analogy, all of us have that work in the church, and we have a responsibility as Christians to be the hand and the feet of Jesus. Something we do here at, at Lincoln Heights to kind of bring us back to the remembrance of who God is, is this awesome thing called communion. And in a few moments, I'm going to invite you guys to grab your communion packets at, at the back of the room. But the reason we do communion here at Lincoln Heights isn't for, for a holy shot, like Pastor Rusin says. It's, it's not to check off, you know, the holy sacrament and 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 make us feel like the best Christians in the world, but it's to bring our hearts and our minds back to what Jesus did for us. He said, do this in remembrance of me. So when you guys open up the little packets and, and you take that wafer, really think about God's body being broken for us, what that really means. And when you flip it over on the other side and, and in your own time, you, you take the juice and you think about God's blood, Jesus' blood being spilled out, what, what that really means, what that imagery really imparts into us. Take that time and, and think about your responsibility this week because it's so easy for that melody to get drowned out in the white noise of our work week, of our families, of our, our duties and our other responsibilities. So take that time, enjoy your time with the Lord. You guys can grab your communion back, back into the back of the room.